I had the best time chatting with today's guest. She is a fellow podcaster, but she has a long history of working in the pet space. She is a pet professional like no other. And we talk about so many things because she stays on top of the pet industry probably even better than I do. We talk about her journey to get where she is. We talked about how interesting it is meeting all of these people that we bring to you on our podcast. And we even get into the war brewing in the dog training industry. There's so much to cover in today's episode. You don't want to miss a minute. So who is today's guest. She is none other than Isabel Alvarez Arada, who is the host of the Covered in Pet Hair podcast. She's also a freelance writer and content creator, and she has been doing rescue work with animals since she was 17 years old. She believes her purpose lies in helping companion animals live better lives by educating their caregivers. And boy, oh boy, is she doing that. The Covered in Pet Hair podcast is a really incredible podcast. She actually had me on last. It was, it aired at December, right before Christmas, December, 2022. We talked about gifts for pet parents and gifts for pets and what I would and would not buy. It was a very interesting episode. So once you're done listening to today's episode on the Pet Parenting Reset, make sure to go over to Covered in Pet Hair. Check out that episode. But I'm so excited to bring you Isabel in today's episode. We talk about so many things and I want you to listen in on it. So here we go. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. <laughs> oh my gracious. Well, Isabel, thank you so much for joining me. Um, we got to meet each other at Super Zoo last year, which was super, super fun. And I had never been to Super Zoo before. I don't know about you, but like I like the whole Super Zoo part was like, eh, okay. But like meeting everybody was so incredible. <laughs> it was my favorite I, thing. I love to shop. So the, the trade show part was actually really fun for me because I got to like play with things and I got to like sample items and products and I discovered some really good stuff. Yeah, no, I, I actually did too. Um, so I guess I shouldn't say it was kind of, I mean, it, it was overwhelming, I think, just because of how big it was. I think that was like the, oh my goodness part, because I'm such like an, an introvert <laughs> Ooh, that, <laughs> that was I was, I, I walked in and it was like, I mean, massive, like three football fields. Right. And then all these people and I'm like, oh no, my whole body is screaming, go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, I've never been either. And it just like, kind of like, I just decided to go spur of the moment, ask my husband, can you take care of the kids? Cause I need to go. And he travels a lot. So we had to make sure that the, you know, that the schedule's coordinated. And I loved it. Cause I love going to Vegas. And it was like one of the first trips. I think it was my second trip alone away from my kids in five plus years. <laughs> So it was great. It was just such a nice, the first day I just did my thing. I went to the pool. I got, I caught a show, went to dinner. And then the next two days were just a whirlwind. And I didn't even get to see, I think they have like 3000 vendors. I know. I feel like I missed, by the time I got home and I saw what everybody else was posting about, I was like, how did I miss all of this? <laughs> And I also came home with like 20 pounds of things. And thank you to the Allegiant Air um, desk agent who did not charge me excess baggage fees because <laughs> I definitely should have paid them. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I feel stuff. like I was like not grabbing stuff by the last day. Like I can't, I can't fit anything more in my <laughs> bag. Exactly. <laughs> 
Oh my gracious. Well, Isabel, um, you have a, an incredible podcast uh, covered in pet hair and we will talk about that in just a few minutes. But before we do, I wanted to kind of ask you like how you, because I know you've done other things in the pet industry prior to this podcast. So like what, tell me what you have done. Tell me like how you decided to work with pets in the first place. I think people like us who decide to work with pets are like a very special breed of people. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I was actually um, working in the hospitality industry uh, with, um, I had just uh, moved in with my ex and one of the things I wanted was a dog. And so he was not a huge dog lover, but he knew that that was part of the deal. Uh, so I, I was like 28, had not had a pet of my own in a long, long time and it was time. So we got Titan and when we were adopting Titan in the, in the Northern Virginia area, the rescue was like, what are your plans? Cause you know, he was secret service. So he traveled a lot and I was in hospitality. So I had events and stuff that would keep me out for longer periods of time than just like a nine to five. So in that conversation, they were like, what are you going to do? This pet, you know, he's, he's four months old. He needs some kind of care. So we were like, of course, we'll find a dog walker. We can afford it. You know, it's, it was the DC thing to do. And then I started looking for a dog walker and there were plenty of companies, but none of them were calling me back. So I was kind of like, what is this? And I had pet sat in college for fun for friends and neighbors. Um, I actually ended up with like a, you know, like a, a nice little repertoire of clients um, and I had to, you know, got to stay in beautiful homes while I was like in a, you know, in a group house in, in college. So I loved it. And my ex was like, well, why, like, why do you think everybody's like, people aren't calling you back? And I said, because they're so busy because on their websites, I could see that they were hiring and I could see that, you know, they were busy. So I said, why don't I just do this? My parents are both entrepreneurs. I grew up talking business at the dinner table. And I was obviously a pet lover. So I said, let's do this. And I just started a pet care business in 2008. And I had that business and multiple employees. And we did um, over the course of 12 years, we did over 100,000 pet sits. Um, I had more than 20 employees. It was wonderful, lucrative, great business. Um, I had no intention of, of changing that business, of going any other route. But the pandemic hit. And while I was still super invested in my business. I was living 2000 miles away from our service area because my husband's military. So we had moved in 2015, set everything up so that I could come back uh, a few times a year to just check in with staff and my managers. But really I was running it remotely. And when the pandemic hit, I knew that it was going to be a lot of work to rebuild the business. And I just had my second baby and she was born in February and the pandemic hit in March. So I was kind of in a place where I was like, am I really going to be going back and forth during a pandemic to save this business? And I said, it just, it doesn't add up anymore. And I called my mom who's super wise. And every time I talk about this, I mention this because it's such a wise question. I called her and said like this Northern Virginia or the state of Virginia shut down for three months. When we reopen, how many people are still going to be working from home? I had a, I have, my sister lives in Spain. So I had an understanding that it wasn't going to be a three month thing, that it was going to be 18 months to two years where things were going to be touch and go. And based on the research they were sharing over there. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, there's nothing going to, there's nothing's going to be left in two years, right? Like everybody's going to have moved away. The DC area is very transient. She asked me very clearly, very level headed. She said, would you open this business today? And I said, of course not. I don't even live in that service area anymore. And she said, well, you have your answer. So we shut down and immediately I was like, I, I can, I, I'm always, I've always been a writer. So immediately I was like, I can just transition, write. And I was, you know, contacted by a few publications and I started writing for them. And I love to write and I love to write for these publications, but I love the pet industry. So I was like, how do I stay in it in a way that allows me to still be a mom, still be a military spouse where I can't really decide my schedule because my husband's schedule is so all over the place. And I came up with covered in pet hair. And luckily I I'm very well connected in the industry. And I mentioned it to a friend who has a podcast on pet life radio. And he introduced me to the executive producer at pet life radio. And, 
when I described it to him as a late night TV inspired boozy show, he said, okay, let's do it. Cause we don't have anything like that on the network. So um, we launched in December of 2020 and I've had such a good time. It's such a good time. It's great to talk to people like you. Um, people in our industry just get each other. We're kind of all cut from the same cloth in a way, even if we don't agree on everything, yeah. we're kind of similar weirdos. So it works. <laughs> I know. I do like oftentimes feel like we're kind of outcasts. <laughs> yes. Like the whole world is going on and everybody's like living their lives and we're over here like, but what about your pets? <laughs> 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 you know, I am def I am 100% that person watching a movie. I'm like, you can do anything to anyone in a movie. But like, if you hurt a baby or an animal, I'm like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> I won't. Most of the reasons why I can't watch any of the zombie movies or any of the shows that are super in right now or have been is because the pets. I can't. The pets and the kids, I just can't. Um, I'm very sensitive to those things. I'm very sensitive. I, I will say that after almost, what is it, like it's been 15, 16 years in the industry, I, I've developed a an ability to kind of separate the real life. So I protect myself from what I see as far as animal abuse or animals in need, because I can't see that every day and still function because it does mm -hmm. affect me so much. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten really good at that. At first I was more into like sharing rescues and helping rescues and transport rescues. And now that I'm a parent, that's not really feasible for me. Um, but I, I help in other ways, in ways like I give, you know, rescues and organizations platforms on my show. Um, I promote their their efforts so that we can help get more donations to them rather than me being in like the trenches with the rescue situation or homeless pets or animal abuse or trap and release and all those things that really do weigh on people like us that love these animals so much, so much more than really your general population. Mm hmm. That's so interesting because I felt the same way and it's kind of why I transitioned into first dog training and now like health coaching is because I was that person. Like you said, I was, you know, doing the adoption events. I was doing TNR. I was like, I, and sharing all these animals that needed a rescue and trying to raise fun. And it was so draining. And yes. I'm not saying that that doesn't need to, that obviously needs to be done, but like I, somebody actually commented on one of my YouTube videos and was like, why don't you do something more productive and actually try to keep these pets out of shelters and rescues? And I was like, like a light bulb went off and I was like, that's what I need to figure out because yes. this yes. is, it was I mean, like emotionally, like killing me. I know that sounds yes. really harsh, but like, oh my God, it was, yeah, I, I totally understand that. I totally get that. Um, and like your progression is, I mean, it's so amazing. First of all, that you built such a, an incredible business in the DC area. I'm also from Virginia, but I'm from the part of Virginia that we're like, Northern Virginia is not Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> where? Just so I'm, cur I'm curious. Where? I'm from Hampton Roads, so like around. Okay, like I've been. I've been. I love that area. Yeah. <laughs> Which is so like it doesn't even have its own identity. I feel like because there's so much military like constantly moving in and out that it's yes. funny to me. Like now that I've been out of Virginia for so many years, that it's like we're like Northern Virginia is not Virginia. <laughs> Well, Virginia is is very much moving blue and moving yeah. like northern. They they consider themselves more northern now, probably because of the military influence and so many people coming in and out. Yeah, um, and it's you know the the some of the bases in the D.C. area in like the Norfolk area are so beautiful that like people from like the West Coast are coming over, bringing their politics with them. So when I was in Virginia, I was still living there when it was mostly a Republican state. And then when I left, it was completely a de Democratic state because Northern Virginia has grown so much mm -hmm. that like all those counties up there are pretty much more populated than the rest of Virginia. Yeah, it is definitely taken a big, I mean, I was born and raised there. I didn't leave there. Well, I spent a year in South Carolina and then I came back to Virginia and then I, we moved in 2013. So I've been gone since 2013. I mean, I've visited family and all, but <laughs> no, it is definitely like I go back and I'm like, 
what is this place? <laughs> Especially because you're in Texas. So like the difference is really marked. I, yeah. I left Virginia after, gosh, like 15 years. I was, I went, I did college in Maryland. So Maryland, um, right outside DC. So I've been in the DC, D DMV for ages. Yeah. And when I left, I went to Louisiana, to the middle of nowhere, Louisiana. And like, that was a shock because one thing I will say about Northern Virginians is that they're very good pet parents. You rarely see, like, I guess the traffic contributes to that. So people are scared that their pets are going to get hurt. So you rarely see stray dogs. If you see a dog or a cat, you kind of assume that it got out and that that person's looking for it because it's not common to see p pets just come and go on there as they please. So I will say, especially working with clients over there was so nice because I never had to, you know, kind of have harsh conversations with my clients about the quality of life that they were offering their pets. They were calling us because they wanted to improve their pets' lives. So it was really nice. I was kind of sheltered, I would say, in the pet scheme of things. And then I moved to Louisiana, the middle of nowhere, near Fort Polk, for those who are familiar. It's southwest Louisiana. So it's it's like four hours northwest of New Orleans. So not the New Orleans no area. <laughs> and um, it was so shocking to see people not take care of their pets, pets coming and going. Like I couldn't walk my dogs anymore. I walked my dogs in an uh, apartment setting for years and never had a stray dog run up to me in Virginia, never had an issue, never felt unsafe. And then I moved to Louisiana and it's like, there's no sidewalk. I'm walking in the street with my dogs. Dogs are coming up to us. There's a wild dog pack in the neighborhood. Like how does oh, that wow. even happen? So it was such a shock. And then I moved to El Paso where it's kind of like in the middle, which is nice. It's a nice, it's a nice in between. I feel like Northern Virginia pet parents, bravo, because they really are exceptional. And I think that that comes with education and with um, understanding what your pets need. And I think that Virginians, when they get pets, they know it's a huge expense and it's a luxury. So they want to do it right. Whereas in Texas here, especially in El Paso, like I get offered a pet like every day. Like, do you need a cat? Do you want a dog? Because there's such a surplus and people are just kind of like taking pets in because they feel bad for them, but they don't have the education or the means to provide for them. So it's really like a an interesting eye-opening experience, better than in Louisiana for sure. But there's a lot of work to be done, like a ton of work to be done, which is why I wanted to stay in the industry and educate and share my passion and share my love because so many people have the best of intentions, but mm -hmm. it just doesn't translate. Sometimes we focus on the wrong things. Our priorities are off and our pets suffer. Yeah. I actually feel like t almost the opposite because of the part of Virginia I grew up in is like, I, that was one of the things about, we originally moved to California. So I left Virginia where all I had known, like I didn't even have dogs until I met my husband because all I had known was that dogs are used for hunting and live outdoors mm. and cat, like you didn't bring cats in your house either. Like it right. was just not a thing where I, where I grew up. And so I was the oddball in my family that brought cats in my house. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that's how I am. In the Latin culture, we're like that too. Cats are like outdoor, outdoor animals. You don't bring them in. Uh -huh. No, I know. Still to this day, my grand, my grandmother. Every time I talk to her, and I talk to her about my cats or even my dogs, because she has never had a pet in her life, and she's in her you know mid eighties. She's like, she, you know, she is that southern grandma, and all she does is bless your heart. Like literally, this is what I get from my grandma all the time: is just bless your heart. <laughs> My grandmother had pets. Uh, she's lived all over the world. And my grandfather was a big pet lover. She always hated them. She hated having them. She didn't want them. She had birds. She had monkeys. She had every, because they've lived everywhere. This is not an American thing at all. In Ecuador, Australia, and Spain, they always had some kind, especially in Ecuador. There was always some kind of pet that needed a home. Like we had a bird that like just flew in the house and didn't leave. My dad gave my mom a monkey as a gift when they were dating. Ecuador is another world. So like, Th that doesn't happen anymore. This was obviously a long time ago, but my grandmother has always hated pets, yet she has a repertoire of all these animals she's had in her house because everybody else <laughs> wanted them. Oh my goodness. That's so funny. It actually reminded me, we, we did have a pet squirrel growing up that lived in a bird cage <laughs> in our kitchen. <laughs> okay. That's crazy because 
I'm terrified of squirrels. So I like I them. Squirrels. They're fine in the yard, but I would never want to interact with one. They're so cute. They're so adorable. Like my mom would actually like make peanut butter sandwiches and like cut them into like little like four pieces and they would come up to the the carport and like grab them out of her hand and stuff. <laughs> it was the cutest thing. That is the cutest thing I've ever heard. Oh my <laughs> gosh. We don't have squirrels here, but if I did, I would be starting to make peanut butter jelly sandwiches or oh, peanut butter sandwiches. Yeah. I know we don't have very many squirrels either, but my dog would just like scare them. My dog will scare them off. They, they, no, no. <laughs> Some of our squirrels in um, the backyard, they will over the summer the the woodpecker we got a woodpecker last year in our oak tree and it scared the squirrels away but prior to that the squirrels would like play with my dog kim they would like come down the tree just far enough to where kim would start to jump up at the tree to to get them and then they would run back up and then they would come down and run back up they were like playing with her That is so funny. In Northern Virginia we had squirrels and chipmunks and I remember the first time I saw a chipmunk I thought that they were fake. Like I didn't realize that chipmunks were like a real animal it until was like I was like Alvin, 20, Simon, and Theodore, right? <laughs> Seriously, I did not know. And so I was like, "What is that tiny little squirrel?" And my then mother-in-law was like, "That's a chipmunk." And I was like, "That's a real thing?" She's like, "What?" Because <laughs> I grew up in Miami, we didn't have chipmunks. We had squirrels, but we we, yeah. we had many squirrels, but we did not have chipmunks. So yeah. My oh, dogs, Titan and Sox, would hunt uh, chipmunks, and one time they got one, and I had to, poor thing. Like, they were hunting dogs. Not, not like, actual hunting dogs. They were hunting breeds, I guess you should say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, enrichment, right? <laughs> Including for me, because I had to figure out, problem solving. How do I get this out of here? Is it dead? Is it not? Like, what am I doing? Yeah. Enrichment for all of us. Oh, my goodness. So... That's that's so cute. I know with your show covered in pet hair, you have had to like you have talked to so many different people in the industry and like to the point like I haven't even been able to go all the way back to the beginning yet <laughs> from the time I met you and I was like, I have I think I've heard of that show somewhere. And then I met you and I was like, you know, trying to play catch up on the show. And um, like you've just talked to so many people different people. I feel like you have had an opportunity to not only share so much with the world, but like probably learn a lot too. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Like that's where I'm so curious because I feel like the same for me. I feel like I have been able to take this podcast and really make it Even, even like, I love putting all this content out into the world and helping people like learn more and do better and be better pet parents. But like, selfishly, I get to have people on that like teach me things that like one on one where like I can listen to them talk all over the place. But like when it's one on one, it's like, oh my goodness, (laughs) this is incredible. This is such great information. So I'm wondering like, what are some of the guests you've had? that have maybe made the like biggest impact on you. And you're like, that was just the most incredible thing I've learned in a long time. Well, I will say that I have, I specialized in dogs and cats when I was in the pet industry as the professional pet sitter. I professional, I was a professional pet sitter full time for seven years. And then I became my ma- the manager and I didn't pet sit anymore. I managed my staff. So I still had to do a ton of training and a ton of things uh, research and I, I got a ton of education so that I could pass it on to my employees. Um, and so I learned a lot in that sense. And I learned that not every person that's in the pet industry is necessarily a pet pro. A lot of people are pet enthusiasts that are making a huge difference for people and pets. So when I started doing the show, I said, I'm going to interview anybody who is a pet pro or enthusiast. Like it doesn't have to be somebody with any kind of uh, certificates, tons of education, but I have been able to reach some really highly educated, fascinating people. Chris Pockle, I love talking to him because he's a, a, a behaviorist. He's a veterinary behaviorist. So he actually went to veterinary school and then he went to veterinary behaviorist school, I guess. He went through the whole process to become a veterinary behaviorist. And on the show, I ask him like, how do you even attain this? Like, 
how much more are you doing than your average veterinarian to learn the behavior aspect of this? And I learned so much of not only the his trajectory, but the general trajectory of veterinarians where they really, they learn about every like species. They don't just, you know, just because they're caring for dogs and cats all day, doesn't mean that they didn't study like the, the bowels of, you know, pigs and cows. Right. So it's super interesting to me. I love talking to him because I learned so much about something that we take for granted, like how much education our veterinarians have to learn or have to get in order to achieve that goal. I also loved speaking to Milena Martini, who is such a fabulous lady, like just as a lady. And then she's a specialist in spe separation anxiety and she is positive based and so knowledgeable. And she specialized, her husband actually is a retired dog trainer. So you know that their passion runs deep and she taught me so much about separation anxiety. And it was just such a good, well-timed show because we were coming out of the pandemic. People were starting to worry about these pandemic puppies and kittens that hadn't been left alone. And I learned so much about whether it's genetic, whether it's our behavior, how we can fix it, what not to do. And so that was really nice because in theory, most of us have, have or will have a pet with separation anxiety. Like I have one, I have had them in the past. Maybe I didn't recognize it, you know, because some mm -hmm. it, there's a spectrum of like some are mm -hmm. really severe, some are not so severe. So that was such an eye opener because I think many people don't realize their pet has severe separation anxiety and they blame the pet for the behaviors. They they make up these crazy stories about mm -hmm. why the pet is doing these things. And you're like, this is not helpful to anybody. The fact that you're rationalizing this without any information is so not helpful. It's not going to get to the bottom of it. It's not going to improve the behavior. And so that was, those were two of my favorite, but I've had so many fun conversations. You and I talked about shopping for Christmas <laughs> gifts or holiday <laughs> gifts. I've had, um, I did a really cool interview in Halloween of 2021. I think I interviewed a funeral director. Oh, wow. And we talked about like, you know, death rituals from different cultures. And that was so fun because in doing the research for my games, I learned so much. Uh, I just interviewed for last Halloween, I did Pam Roussel. I, I interviewed Pam Roussel and we talked about black, black cat mythology. And like, that's just so fun. It's stuff that we've all heard of, but we haven't really done a deep dive on. Um, I really, I could talk all day about like my awesome guests because I really, I, like you, I can select them. I select them based on their presence or their philosophies or just their personalities. Mm -hmm. It's people that I want to get to know better. Um, mm -hmm. And if I don't want to get to know better, I'm not inviting them on right? my show. You know? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so many things in there. I, so Milena De Martini, like her book mm -hmm. is somewhere back here. <laughs> this awesome. is like my handbook. It was the very first book I read about dog training because I had a dog with separation anxiety and I was like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to learn how to be a dog trainer because yep. of her book. So I love that <laughs> so much. Like I, that is probably the book that I have like the most little like tags in because I'm just like, there's so much, so much in She's there. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. She has a, she has a parent course, um, that I actually have, um, promoted to professional pet sitters because I'm still very much involved in the pet sitting industry. I'm actually going to be emceeing the Texas pet sitters conference, uh, at the end of February. Um, oh, and I have, yeah, I've always promoted her course, which is like a small course. It's not super expensive. It's for pet parents, pet pros that have to deal with this. And it's an online course. She helps, you know, you can get in touch with her and her other dog trainers. She trains dogs, dog trainers in separation anxiety. So the people that are part of her curriculum or her, um, I guess her, her team, she, she employs them. I think, um, they all also specialize in separation anxiety. So she's really just like a wealth of knowledge. And I think these kinds of courses that are, you know, self-paced and um, with some support are so important for people like professional pet sitters, dog trainers that are going out and, and dealing with these very acute situations without maybe as much knowledge as they mm -hmm. really should have. And we can't all specialize in something like right. we can't all specialize in everything, especially, you know, 
if you're doing puppy training and that's your specialty, there might be a little bit of separation anxiety showing there and you still need to be able to address it, even though you don't specialize in separation mm -hmm. anxiety. And those kinds of things are really important for professionals and pet parents, because like you said, we want to keep pets out of the system. And if your pet is misbehaving because of separation anxiety, and there's a course that you can spend maybe a couple hundred dollars on, I can't even remember if it's that much. Um, why wouldn't you, you know, like that could really solve the problem and, and create such a harmony in your home that you're missing right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it is definitely a specialization. I try to tell people that, um, just how how many things in dog training is a specialization and then as you were saying veterinary behaviorist like that is a specialization and you know because so, so many people are like just go find a dog trainer well it's not that simple <laughs> like Please i just don't you know, just find a dog trainer right or like i'm just gonna go to petco or whatever like okay you can start there but that's yeah. like <laughs> there's just so much more than that that is so scary to me because people think, and that's why people I think get discouraged because people think they're doing the right thing. Like I'm going to go find a dog trainer, unfortunately. And I have personal experience with this, with my dog socks, finding a dog trainer was the worst thing we did for her because we found the wrong dog trainer and we scarred her for life. We traumatized mm -hmm. her. We used force and aversion at a time that I didn't know any better. And her behavior was, you know, textbook, the result of aversives and punishment-based mm -hmm. techniques. And so when I tell people, go get a dog trainer, I'm really careful to be like, you need to do your research and find the right dog trainer, even if they're not in your area. Even if it's virtual, you are way better off finding the right person over Zoom than you are finding the wrong person down the street because you could create so many more problems. Absolutely. And that is terrifying. And if People get discouraged. People are like, well, if I'm going to mess up my dog, I'm not going to do anything. But taking mm -hmm. on a pet is means doing something for them and for you and for your home and for your family when you need to. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I actually had no idea where you stood on that <laughs> prior to this conversation. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't. I mean, you never know because there's actually, and, and I don't know how much into the like dog training world you are on social media, but like, very into it and I know there's a war happening right now. There <laughs> it is crazy right now. And yes. I, I personally am like so enamored with Zach George because he provides such amazing information for people and seems so humble about it. That's one of the things that like just people in general, I don't care what your profession is. Like if you're an a-hole and you're like, I know better than you and you, you have mm -hmm. to listen to me. And if you think you're going to find something somewhere else and blow, you know, like that just annoys the mess out of me. <laughs> like, yes. No. So like that, just like humility that people have, I think draws me to them a lot of times. Um, yeah. So I'm definitely like pro positive reinforcement. <laughs> Me too. And what's interesting, I I learned pro pos I'm pro positive reinforcement because of I, I saw the the outcome of force with my dog socks. She was such a social, wonderful puppy, and we destroyed her. And like to this day, I will go to the grave with the guilt that I I changed who she was at, at her core, and I made her a f reactive, distrusting wreck of a dog. Um, granted, she was beautiful to us. She was wonderful to us, but she was unpredictable and it was our fault. Um, but over the course of my show, I've interviewed so many amazing dog trainers, Michael Shikashio, um, Aaron, um, Aaron Moore. She uh, is a dog training coach. Um, and so many people have started with aversives in their mm -hmm. careers and they have learned and seen like I did. I, I did it in a personal level, right? Like I was my dog at working with a dog trainer um, who called himself professional. Um, and then these people have actually been the dog trainer. They've been the one leading um, in the techniques and they've learned that they weren't working and they weren't sustainable and that they, a lot of these pets desensitize. So you have to use more force and it just, it becomes like this really vicious truly vicious cycle. Um, and I love to hear that people recognize like 
I started in the wrong direction and I adjusted. Unfortunately, today, I feel like there are too many people who are like holding on to that cognitive dissonance, like like if their lives depended on it. They're like, nothing else can be done. You know, aversives are fine and I'm going to, you know, I'm dying on this hill. And I feel like it's okay to say like, there, there's a better way and I'm going to try it. Or at least maybe there's a better way and let me see if I should try it, right? Like be a little bit more open. Um, and right. once you start using the positive reinforcement, you see the results so quickly, like really truly and the excitement in your pet and like that kind of, just like with little kids, when they get something right, they get so proud of themselves. Their confidence is higher. Their, you know, their outlook on life and the world is safer. I just love to see that improvement in their like, physical and mental and emotional energy, not just their behavior. Mm -hmm. I People had no idea we were going to, yeah, I had no <laughs> idea we were going to talk about dog training today. I'm super, super excited about it. <laughs> well, I'm not a, a, a professional dog trainer. I've never got any certifications. I've got, I've taken courses, but I have plenty of opinions and experience with dog training because a lot of pet sitting is going into people's homes when they're not there and 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 recognizing behaviors and ad addressing behaviors, obviously, as kindly and as positively as you can, but also effectively so that the pet gets the walk or the feeding or the medicine administration that they need. So in 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 professional pet sitting, you do learn a lot about behavior. Mm -hmm. A body language and things like that, just because in order to do the job properly, you need to be able to do that. So I love dog training. I hate the reluctance of pet parents to listen to advice. That is probably why I'm not a dog trainer. I would, every time that I talk to anybody, I mean, and give advice because of this experience, I've been in the pet industry for over 15 years and they don't take that advice and then they put the pet in a bad situation and the pet suffers. Mm -hmm. I get so like discouraged that I don't know that I would have the emotional bandwidth to do that over and over every day as many dog trainers do. Yeah, they do. Pet and it is it can be. sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh no, for sure. Like it can be very, very difficult. I feel very blessed in the clientele that I've had thus far. Um, but also like, and that's one of the reasons that I, I'm kind of shifting more towards health coaching is because I've seen so many positive behavioral changes when we actually change the diet in these dogs that I've trained. So it's, it's really been like a shift for me that I'm like, I, I want, this is really what, where I, I want to go. But, um, yeah, dog training is still like just such a passion of mm -hmm. mine because I think I, I I dug in to figure out how I wanted to learn and where I wanted to learn and what made sense to me. And I feel like if I can do that, any pet parent should be able to do that and realize that there are differences out there in how people train and you really need to find what resonates with you. And if you really think about it, what's resonating with you is the most positive thing you can do with your dog to build trust and build a relationship. So that's my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I'm on that soapbox with you. I I was at the hair salon last week and uh, my stylist was had a kitten that did not match well with her cat. And so she had brought it to the salon and I got to play with it, which was such a you know blessing. Um, but she had brought it to the salon so that her other, another stylist in the salon could take it home and test it out in her house. And so of course I'm sitting there and my stylist knows what I do. And she has me kind of guide the lady. The lady has three dogs. I ask about their experience with cats, like their history with cats. She has not, not had a cat in a long time. One of them has never been exposed to a cat. Other ones have blah, blah, blah. One's really old. So I'm starting to kind of get red flags and concerns about this not being the safest place for a very shy, not confident four month old kitten. Yeah. And so I tell her, you have to introduce super slowly. You can put him in danger if you do not introduce slowly. She has like a coyote mix. Like, oh, wow. Like, one of her dogs is like some kind of coyote mix. Okay. So like talk about prey drive, right? Yeah. So 
I'm really concerned. My stylist is just like feeling awful because that cat loves her. She loves the cat, but it's just not working. She tried to go back to the rescue where she got him and they won't call her back. So like she's done everything right. I'm my husband's like driving over to meet the cat because we're about to get a cat. Right. But my my son is allergic to everything and he has asthma. So like it's probably not going to match here either. And I don't want to keep bringing this cat to a million places only for him to be rejected because I know that that's going to affect the cat in such an important part time of his life at four months. That's a really critical developmental period. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling her all these things. I'm giving her all the advice. I'm trying to hopefully make it work. She says she has an eight year old daughter who can't wait to have this cat. So I'm like, okay, well, let's hope that it works out. I get a message from my stylist hours later and was like, she just introduced the cat to everybody immediately. And I have to go pick him up right now. And that's, that's the stuff that just kills me. Break you were heart. given, you were given all the tools from somebody that could have charged you $250 for that consultation, but I gave it to you all in plain language for free f with all the goodwill in my heart in the hopes that that cat would not experience a trauma that would mark him for life because at four months it will mark him for life. And you did whatever you wanted because you thought you knew better. And that to me is so frustrating and so discouraging. And so it's also one of the reasons why I podcast, I share the information. You can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you hear something awesome on my show. It inspires you to do better. Great. But I don't have the emotional strength for these kinds of scenarios to keep happening because pet parents aren't open to listening to experts. Like we are experts. After yeah. 15 years in an industry, after decades in an industry, like you and I have, we are experts and we know a thing or two. And it's not because I want to be respected as an expert, but because I want to save the pet, the trauma that you inevitably caused. And you are not open to that because what? Because like you said, it's just, it's the pet industry. Everybody else is doing important things and we're just here talking about pets. <laughs> right. <laughs> and well, I mean, it reminds me of two really, really important principles in like marketing in general, um, because that's what my husband does is, is online marketing. And well, he did offline marketing most of his life, but now that there's the internet. Um, and one of those things is that if you give something away for free, people are never going to follow through. Agreed. And then and then they want to and then they bitch and moan when they when you charge for it. But it's like right. I actually want you to take this information and I want you to learn it and I want you to implement yeah. it. And the best yes. way for that to happen is for you to have some whether it's monetary or otherwise, like you have to give. Yes. To to, to have that like and I think so many people don't understand that, it, that it's not just like, well, yes, I have to pay my bills. So obviously I need to charge you. But like I, I actually give a crap. Yes. So I'm charging you. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, it's, it's true. Like <laughs> it's just one of those like truisms that nobody understands, yeah. but that's the way it is. But also and I think you and I both have, have figured this out because of we have podcasts is give your best information away for free. You know yeah. what I mean? Like put it out there so anybody can learn and grow and do better. Most people, however, are still going to need that like one-on-one -on -one handhold walk you through yeah. it. So I have yeah. to charge you. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, that that was so disappointing. And I I said to, you know, and, and my stylist said to like drop everything that evening and go get the cat. And she was like, well, do you want him? And I, as much as I do want him, I would love to have a kitten. I love cats. I'm allergic, which is fine. I could probably get shots or whatever. But my son has severe asthma. And every time that he has illness or any kind of like sees like, um, you know, allergy season, he gets such bad flares and he's five. All the men in my family have asthma. So by the time they were like 10, 12, it kind of went away. So oh, really? I kind of have to just sit tight and wait. Yeah. It was kind of like a childhood asthma situation, which is very common. So I have to sit tight, but I was so tempted to just take the cat. But again, I know enough to understand that every time that this cat gets rejected from a house, it knows. Mm -hmm. It knows that didn't work and this didn't work and this didn't work. Mm -hmm. And it just 
In the same way that rejection affects us and our self-esteem and our confidence, it affects pets. And people don't understand that our pets are feeling beings that really pick up on nonverbals quite well, Mm -hmm. right? And they really kind of know more than we give them credit for knowing. And I don't want to be part of his cycle of rejection. So I was like, you know, she has a trip coming up. So I was like, if you need me to foster him for 10 days, like while you're gone, I will be happy to do that. Because if you want to keep working on your cat and, and this cat and seeing, you know, I gave her some resources of cat experts that I love and follow that have been on my show. And I was like, follow them, you know, contact them. I'll even help you pay for a consultation with, you know, um, my friends, the Cat Behavior Alliance, Rita and Linda, they're personal friends. I've known them for a long time. And I was like, I'll help you pay for a consultation with them. Let me help you in some other way than taking this cat. But there's just, there's only so much that each of us can do, right? The yeah. person has to be willing to work with it or find a better home for it. She's awesome. So she's going to do right by this cat. That's not always the case, unfortunately. And right now with shelters being as full as they are, it's just, yeah. it's so hard to think about what could happen to that cat. Oh, I know it breaks my heart. I can't let myself think about things like that I most know. of the exactly. time. Exactly. And that's why we need to take personal responsibility. When we do take in a pet with socks, for example, um, the dog that I raised with aversives, um, she had, uh, she had a urinary issue from day one. And I remember saying to my then my ex being like any other family would have returned her. Like any other family would have been like, we can't do this. She would pee in her crate. We had no idea what was happening. She was prone to UTIs. Like it was, Long story short, she needed a booty lift. We got her a surgery that made it better. She had an innie, not an outie when it comes to vulvas. That's a whole other show. And she, once she got the surgery, never had a UTI again. You know, again, another conversation for another time because I learned so much from that experience. But any other family would have been like, I can't be up four times a night with a dog. I can't come home to my, to my pet, like covered in, pee because she would pee outside. We knew she was potty trained. There was a physical, physiological mm-hmm. reason she was not being able to hold it. And it was, yeah, it was all that. It was that she needed a surgery. Oh, bless you. That was, that, Cosmetic you know, that makes me, yeah. <laughs> well, no, Cosmetic that was, surgery, that was yeah. still medical, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it was totally cosmetic, but it, Fix yeah. the medical issue or like yeah. the impractical. If she had been a wild dog, like it wouldn't have bothered her. Like she would have been fine. She probably would have had, you know, a shorter life because she would have had like some serious infection that wouldn't have gone away. But um, she she had a really good life. She We did everything we could for her. Uh, we messed her up and then we saved her in a Aww. way. And, you know, she's, she taught me so much. Every time we take a dog, every time we take a cat, like they teach us so much. And she was one of my best teachers. Oh, they are always our good teachers. I did want to ask you if you have heard. um, So it's been a little in the past year, Jay and Adrian, you can find it on their, on the two crazy cat ladies website. They, it links to the doctor's website there's a homeopathy for cat allergies. Yes. I don't know if you yes. that since you have allergies. Yes, too. I have. So I had a client. So I went to a homeopath in Northern Virginia ages ago because one of my clients, cat, he had, he had a cat named Feisty who was super feisty. Like, t- like <laughs> Feisty was an understatement for this cat. I loved the doctor, Dr. Fisher. He was wonderful. And he had, when I was kind of in the, in the consultation, he told me, oh, I used to have cat allergies, but I went to a homeopath. My homeopath made me a tincture that made it go away. And he, this particular homeopath used a tincture that he made with the cat's hair and saliva. Mm -hmm. And I like, kind of like put that in my back pocket and have thought about it. Unfortunately, I just, I don't know if it would work with Noah. And again, like it's one of those things where I don't want to bring a cat only to try it. So what we have planned, my husband and I is at the zoo here, there is a cat cafe. So what we're planning on doing is kind of like once springtime comes, it's a little nicer, a little, I don't love zoos. I really like as an animal lover, they're hard for me, but that's again another conversation for another day. But my kids love zoos. So, you know, you, you make your, 
kind of like compromises. But if because this one has a cat cafe, bait rescue cat cafe in the um, building, we're thinking of going, getting like the membership, going frequently to see how he does. So that way we have an informed decision based on whether or not he can have a cat. I would love a cat. I'm not ready to get another dog. I have one dog left of four dogs that I had. I mean, in 20, 2019, I had four dogs. 2020, I lost socks. 2021, I think we did okay. 2022, we lost radar. 2023, a few weeks ago, we lost Titan. So it's been a lot of loss and I'm not ready for that yet. And I love old dogs. So if I were to rescue a dog, it would be an old dog. So again, like I'm just not ready to take that on because with an old dog, you just don't know what you get. So I would love to have a cat. I think Kira, my dog, would love to have a companion. She's cat friendly. She's dog friendly. She's people friendly. She's wonderful. Um, and she has separation anxiety. So maybe a mate would be a little bit nice to have. Uh, but again, it's all kind of like a slow process that we're thinking about, but I will definitely look into the crazy cat ladies uh, homeopath because I would definitely need that because I have always had cat allergies, but I've always had cats. We had cats growing up in Miami and I remember like my nose running constantly when I was a kid and like, nobody cared. This was like the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Nobody cared. They were like, blow your nose. Right. Like nobody cared why I was <laughs> chronically like, you know, had a runny nose. Um, but I'm pretty, like, I'm pretty sure I'm severely allergic to cats, but like, for me, I wouldn't even care. Yeah. Like, I know. like to me, like the, the benefit of having a cat supersedes the allergy, but again, for yeah. me, a little bit different. <laughs> of course. My husband came home with my dog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't worry. Stop. Kira was barking <laughs> when we first started. It's <laughs> It's part of the, it's part of the fun of these podcasts. It it is. You're absolutely right. Well, I can't believe that we've almost been on here a whole hour. Thank you so much. It was so fun talking to you. Um, one random question that I I try to remember to ask people at the end. Um, just something random that like isn't necessarily pet related, just to like get to know you a little bit better. Is like, what are you reading or listening to right now that you would recommend to other people? Okay, so I did read something awesome that I recommend to everybody who's in any way a creator, and okay. it's called Show Your Work. And if you have not read it, it's so great. It's such an easy read. You can read it in like two days in the evening. I love it so much. I have not read, I can't remember the author's name, but I, he has another one that's called Steal Like an Artist, which I've not read, and that was the one that came before this book. Show Your Work is so fun for anybody who's a creator. I'm a writer and obviously podcaster. Um, I have a hard time showing my work, my process. I kind of think that it's not important. So I love that book. It was great. What's really funny about that book is there's a part where it says like what you should share on social media and what you should not. And basically the not list is everything I share. Because it was like, <laughs> it said, don't share puppies, kittens, babies, lattes, um, sunsets. And I'm like, that's literally all I share because those are like my favorite things. And then like maybe a latte, maybe a glass of wine, maybe a cocktail, but I always share things like that. So it's funny because it's, he's talking about basically like artists, like painters or things like that. Like if you're sh promoting like your sculptures, maybe your latte is not important. But for me, from, you know, from the boozy pet podcast perspective, like sharing my glass of wine is totally okay. But it was really funny that he said like, don't do that. And I was like, check, check, check. All the <laughs> and then as far as podcasts, I listen to all the pet podcasts that are done by my friends. I listen to yours. I listen to the two crazy cat ladies. I listen to Kim um, Gautier's um the and with with her friend the oh my god I she has remember. two she has um oh, the girls with dogs because i okay. love her friend the doodle Ka the, the kathy doodle mom. something yeah kathy kathy bennett Yes, I yes, love yes. her so much. She's been on my show too, and Kim was on my show. Um, but I usually listen to when I'm like really like vegging out. I listen to Bravo Recap podcasts. I love okay. Everything Iconic by Danny Pellegrino. So bad it's good with Ryan Bailey. 
at bitch sesh. I love all of these things that are all about Bravo because if I don't have time to watch the Bravo shows, which are like my guilty pleasures, they recap them for me. So I feel like I've caught up as a busy mom. I can't always sit in front of the TV. Like I miss the days of just like binging Bravo all the time. I can't do that. And Bravo's not kid friendly for the most part. So it's not like I can watch it when the kids are there. No. Um, I tried to watch Winter House with the kids in the, in the house and they're having like this like sexy party and I was like okay that's like a butt cheek and that's gotta go so that's why I listen to these podcasts because they you know they give me the PG version of these shows so <laughs> that, if that doesn't give you a glimpse into my psyche then I don't know what does I love work and I love play and I love them equally awesome. <laughs> I appreciate that. And yeah, I think I actually think we have that book, Show Your Work, and I haven't read it. So maybe I'll have to go grab it. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Go pick it up. You'll be done with it within like a few days. It's not a hard read. It's yeah. very simple and it's very fun. And it, it's just a good reminder. Like it's not, not, it's not going to blow your mind. It's yeah. just a good reminder. Yeah. Well, we need that, me. right? Like just because you know something doesn't mean that you can't relearn it and relearn it better. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And like, it gives you, um, sometimes I feel weird putting my life out there. Like I don't have a problem sharing my opinions, but then sometimes I'm like, who cares? What would I think? Like, mm -hmm. so he reminds you in the book that like, there are people out there that really do care what you think. And there are people out there who could benefit from what you're sharing and who could grow simultaneously alongside you while you're sharing these things. So that was a nice reminder that it's like, it's not just me being like, look at me. It's me sharing what makes me me and what I'm passionate about, which other, you know, you find your kind of like we did, you find your tribe or your, your connections, the people that, you know, your, your kindred spirits. And yeah. that's kind of what he wants. He wants the, these creators to kind of get, get out of their shells, get up and share more of their process to inspire other people to do the same. Awesome. Yeah, no, that is a good thing. Cause I'm like, yeah, I'm like, who, who cares what I do in my, my home with my personal, life, right? Like, let me give you what I found in my knowledge, but like never exactly. show me how I get there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's all about sharing the process. Awesome. Well, thank well, you so much for inviting me. I had such a good time chatting with you. I did too. Thank you so much. And um, people can find you covered in pet hair just anywhere, covered right? Like here on all the podcasting platforms, on all social media, and uh, YouTube channel is covered in pet hair, and my website is covered in pet hair .com. Awesome. So go check out Isabel on covered in pet hair and. Yeah. Thank you so much. Give, I always end with give your pets some extra love from me. So give your pets some extra love from Isabel today as well. Yes, absolutely. Please do. I don't have enough in my house right now. One pet is the first <laughs> time in decades that I've had one pet and I think she's enjoying the one-on-one -on -one attention. I'm going to go walk her right now actually, uh, but I miss all the snuggles. Oh, well, thank you so much, Isabel. And I had so much fun talking to you. I can't wait to have you on again. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon and hopefully we'll see each other at Super Zoo again this year. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos in my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.